Good morning to all of you as well. Um, we're delighted that so many of you are joining this morning. And uh, just to say that uh, uh, Jim's given a really good introduction, and I'm sorry if I repeat any of uh, the things that he said, but um, through this beginner's workshop, we aim to help you to learn to identify wildflowers through recognising their families. Using the Pocket Guide to Wildflower Families, which booklet you should have received after booking and on which much of the course is based. Um, as Jim said in the past, identifying wildflower families has been a hands-on face-to-face workshop that COVID-19 has forced changes upon us. And um, although this is not the ideal format for learning how to identify wildflowers, as we would much rather meet you in person and study real plants, call me old fashioned, but I'd just rather be in the room with you all. Um, with all meetings cancelled in 2020 and with uncertainty continuing, we've chosen this medium to connect with those of you who would like to start wildflower identification. And we hope that this will be a helpful introduction and enable you to practice and progress, build up confidence and enjoy wildflowers more and more as you delve deeper into their detail and intricacies, common features and differences. And as Jim said, um, it's, it's really crucial that you uh, engage with the plants themselves and get out and get up close to them. This, it, it really isn't um, a, a subject that you want to just look at a screen to be involved with. So you'll already have seen the, the uh, programme. The webinar is in three sections, uh, each lasting uh, the, sorry, the first lasting about 15 to 20 minutes, parts two and three lasting about 35 minutes, and with a 10 minute break between uh, after parts one and parts two. Um, there's a wee challenge set for these breaks if you want to test your brain a wee bit rather than have a rest. And um, the first of, of those has been sent out to you in the form of the diagram um, of plant structure, which we hope that you'll have a go at uh, during the first break if you haven't already had a look at it. And um, we'll, we'll come to that as we finish the end of this first section. Um, I hope you've had a an opportunity to look through the pocket guide. The introductory pages help to set the context for the wildfire family strategy. The reasoning behind this approach we briefly explain in part one followed by a short list of equipment that you will need to be successful. In part two, basic plant structure and some botanical terms are introduced, which will help you when we start to use the pocket guide to find the family of a wildflower. In part three, we introduce you to some simple keys and then to using a key in a field guide. And we finish with some information and advice on how to develop your interest in wildflower identification and some homework that is Jim's idea. So although I'm the retired teacher, I'm happy to, to blame the homework on him. But it's optional and provides a practical follow-up challenge to get you out and practicing on your own. So let's get back to some pretty flowers and uh, introducing the wildflower family strategy. There are about 3,600 species of flowering plants in the British Isles distributed among about 120 families. And we're talking about wildflower species here. However, about 70% of these species belong to just 20 large families. If that sounds scary, only about 1,500 of these are truly native to the British Isles. So I'm just going to give a little bit of information about the term native here. So native is described in the Collins Guide as thought to have arrived in an area by means of natural dispersal, I, that is not introduced. And it's perhaps predictable that introduced is described as not native. But to clarify a little, this describes plants brought into the British Isles either accidentally or intentionally since about 1600 AD. For example, all of the poppies here are described in Collins as introduced in antiquity or introduced with agriculture. 
accepting the um, poppy with the blue arrow pointing to it, which is Welsh poppy, which is native in Wales, Southwest England and Ireland and naturalised throughout the rest of the British Isles, especially in the north. So this one is considered uh, native in certain parts of the British Isles and these are all introduced. Now with 1500 natives still sound scary, then bear with me. Let's just have a very quick look at four strategies we might use to identify, uh, identify a wildflower such as this one. Method one is flick through all the pages in your field guide and play snap. But bearing in mind how many wildflower species there are to play snap with, you may find a similar flower, but it may not be the correct similar looking wildflower. Uh, and it does take some time. Method two, start at the general key of your field guide and work your way through. But as a beginner, there will be many terms you don't recognize and your identification journey will probably be long and rather arduous. You will learn, but remembering all that you learn as you go, it may be quite a large task. Method three, you can use an app such as Seek or Sunbird, and there are many other apps that you can use to identify wildflowers. This may be quick, but again, it is a form of matching. And with so many possible matches, how can you be sure of the correct match? And also, have you learned any strategies in order to help you identify the next wildflower? But it is useful and it is a good pointer. Method four is the method that we are going to guide you through and explain today, which is to find the family first and use the pocket guide to wildflower families, which I'll just call the pocket guide from now on. Why? Well, to recap, we have 3,600 species of flowering plants, 120 families, 70% of these species belong to just 20 large families, Therefore, identifying the features of a wildflower that can place it in a family group can make it easier to identify which member of that family your plant is. The pocket guide introduces 24 of the most common families and each one of those families is represented here by one species and, uh, and one picture. And the flowchart points you in the direction of another 26 families. So the pocket guide kind of covers 50 of the, of the common and largest families to start you off. To use the pocket guide, you only need to know a few basic terms. All the terms used are explained in the glossary at the back and, they are, and there are diagrams of them on pages where they are used. Like any new subject or a new language, there are things that you will need to know and learn. The pocket guide keeps things simple and eases you into botanical terms. And we'll spend some time on this in the next section. So looking at uh, the equipment, it's not a, it's not a great deal. Um, the pocket guide you can take with you a uh, hand lens is invaluable. A uh, times 10 magnification is the most useful and these can be ordered online um, very easily and they're not very expensive. A field guide is essential for moving on to identify flowers in the field, such as the two illustrated here. There are many field guides available, but we recommend these as they use keys to guide you through the identification process rather than just matching a plant to a picture. Of these two, the Collins Guide would be our favourite choice as it is the most up-to-date and reflects recent name changes in wildflowers, uh, which does happen um, fairly frequently. So having an up-to-date guide is, is very useful. Uh, coming up next, um, after our break is uh, we are going to introduce plant structure 
And this is where, um, I know it's fairly early in the day, but uh, you may want to have a, a comfort break or a, a coffee and uh, have a look at the diagram of the plant structure that is here on the screen or that you should have received in an email. Um, whichever way you do it, then it would be really helpful for you if you were to try and match the plant name, uh, the plant part names to the numbered points in the diagram. And uh, I just want to warn you that it would be really great if uh, when we come back after the break and we check over the, um, the names uh, attached to the, the plant parts, um, you could tot up your score and share it with us. Now, no one else will know what your score is, but it would give us an indication of how many of these um, plant parts are familiar to you and that you recognise or that are perhaps unknown, unfamiliar um, new terms. Uh, just, just for a bit of fun, really. And uh, we'd, we'd, but, but for us, it's quite handy to know, you know how many of these terms are familiar. So have a go at that. Have a, have a bit of a break. Uh, remember to ask any questions if you would like to and we'll try to answer those as well. Jim? Uh, that's, that's great, Aileen. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, just to reassure everyone, uh, this will be an anonymous poll. <laughs> so you, don't worry about that. Um, I, we've just had one question uh, that's just come in, Aileen. Uh, Ford asks, I have a first edition of the Collins Guide from 2009, uh, when it's just the Collins Flower Guide. Is it okay uh, until I can source the second edition? Well, I, I think it's, it's perfectly fine. Um, the, the second edition um, only tweaks a few things. The, the problem with the first edition is that um, the page numbers given in the pocket guide relate to the second more recent edition uh, but the, the first the first edition is is e equally good though. hi everyone um okay Aileen can, can I just really a few questions uh, a few questions have come in during the break mm -hmm. um uh the first one uh, is does naturalized mean that is not invasive or are the two ex mutually exclusive? Well, invasive species can be, uh, are often naturalized. The, 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 there's two, two separate concepts here. And naturalized just means that uh, a non-native species has made itself at home in the wild. Uh, whether it goes on to become invasive is a different question. Well, most, fortunately, most of our, our naturalized species uh, are not invasive. 90% uh, of them are, are live perfectly happy uh, with all the natives. Just a very few species like um, Japanese knotweeds and giant hogweed that go on to become really invasive. So two different ideas there. Um, and uh, Aaron asks, some people learn plants through their habitats instead of families exclusively. Do you think uh, welfare families is a better method? Um, well, uh, have, a think, have a think about that while, while I have a go at answering it. I, I would say nearly all botanists use the family method. But botanists, if, if they come across a, a plant species they can't recognize, they look for family similarities. Um, okay, the, the habitat is, is, is a clue, but only once you know what to expect in that habitat. Uh, so I, I think the, the family approach is by far the best. Uh, would you not agree, Aileen? Well, I, I think, yeah, you, we, do what, we do like grouping things together. And I guess if you look at different habitats, you're always going to find um, different species that belong to uh, the, the, the common thread between them is, is the families that they belong to. So 
in order to identify them, I do, I do think you're always going to be looking at features and those features will be common in the families. Whereas in habitats, um, you're, you're, you're just going to have a particular variety of plants that are, are suited to um, that, that habitat, that place where they're growing or, or don't grow. So I think families gives you the way in to then identify plants wherever they are. Yeah. But perhaps uh, we've been through the families method uh, it, that that might that might help to clarify, you know, how it works. Yeah, yeah. OK, uh, another quick question uh, again from Aaron, who asks uh, BSBI, BSBI has a field skills pyramid for determining botanical skill level. Um, how long do you think it, it takes to progress through these pyramid levels? Well, I, I would say uh, you go on learning throughout your life. I would say it's a, uh, it, it is quite quick to, to get up the first few steps in the skills pyramid, uh, but it gets harder and harder as you, you approach the, uh, the tip. But it, and the best botanist, if you know, it's all the best botanists. They're, they're very old. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> so, sorry, Eileen. <laughs> I was just going to, well, I, I'm not in that category, so that's okay. But um, I, I'll just add to that that, you know, it does depend how much time you put, like anything else, it depends how much time you spend, um, you know, practicing your skills. Yeah. And um, if, you, if you're putting a lot of time in, then you'll obviously progress more quickly. And the more time you spend with other botanists, and um, in, in that kind of learning situation from other people, then you will progress more quickly as well. I think there's no doubt about that. Yeah, it's so important to get out with other botanists, isn't it? That, uh, you can only do so much by yourself, but uh, that getting out with other botanists uh, gives you opportunity to calibrate your understanding, to check that uh, what you are thinking is right in the field. And that is invaluable as well as being a lot of fun. Yeah. Anyway, um, that, those are the questions. How okay. did everybody get on with uh, their break task? Uh, okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide then. I hope you've, I hope you've had a chance to, to do this. So yes, yeah, so the break was actually a bit of a cheat, wasn't it? Because it was a working break. Um, we asked you to, to do a task, which normally we would have done in the classroom of all together. Um, but we haven't got that uh, opportunity. So we've, uh, I seem to have lost my ability to change the slide here. Well, I don't know why. Oh, here we are. Okay. Um, okay, so, so here are the answers um, now in number order. They were in alphabetical order before so that I didn't give you any clues. And um, I'm sure that lots of these terms will have been familiar to you. So I'm just going to go up from the root, which is hopefully a, a safe start. Um, and then we reach the, the top of the, the soil and into the green part of the plant. And so here at the bottom, we've got the basal leaves or leaf. These may or may not be present. And uh, as, as Jim pointed out to me yesterday, um, when you're looking at the plant, they may have been present, but actually have uh, withered and fallen off by the time you're looking at the plant. So be careful of that. And do when you're looking at a plant, do check the bottom um, right down to the base to see if there are basal leaves present. And these may differ from the stem leaves, as we will see. So then going up the stem, we meet the first pair of stem leaves here. But at the point under where the leaf joins the stem, you'll see that um, one of the labels is the node. So that is pointing to the point where the leaf joins the stem and underneath it. Here. Uh, on this leaf, you can see that there are veins. And then we're going to carry on up the stem. And at this point, you will see that 
there will there will be not labeled this time but there will be another node under the leaf join and it won't surprise you to know that this distance between these two points is called the internode so that may be a measurement you need when you're identifying a plant so we've got another two leaves and <clears throat> this is the stem leaf and in this case you can see it is different from the base the basal leaf Underneath these leaves, there is a small leaf-like structure. These are called stipules, and these may or may not be present on your plant specimen. Above the leaf join, in this space here, this is called the axle. And I know that if you've ever grown tomatoes, um, you'll know this point because this you always have to pinch out the um, branches that, that start to grow in the axles. Carrying on up the stem, we've then got a, a, a branch and another branch on this side, which has on the end here a flower and on this end here a flower bud. The stem, the flower stem that attaches the, the, the flower to the main stem may have a stalk. So the flower may have a stalk, which is termed the pedicel. This you will definitely have got, the, uh, the petal, and up here, um, the, and the structures underneath the petals, so the green parts underneath here, are called sepals. And again, this may or may not be present, this is a small leaf-like structure on the pedicel, on the flower stalk, which is called the bract. So um, you, can, you can perhaps have a, have a tot up of your um, terms that you were familiar with and perhaps let us know what, how many terms you were unfamiliar with. So, um, so basically, what was your score? <laughs> if you don't mind sharing that with us, that would be great. Okay, I've brought up the, the poll on screen. So I add your score. I'll just give you a few minutes. Okay, I think that's it. Oh, no, there's still some, some people adding. See all of those. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, I shall share the results so everybody, everybody can see. Uh, is that coming up, coming up on screen okay, Eileen? Yet I, I can perhaps... Uh... Okay. So, I think let's... Oops. Okay, I've taken it off the screen now. Um, and okay. uh, I think there was a... a, a Pretty, um, a pretty uh, well spread between um, having all of them correctly identified and having sort of half down to a, a reasonable mix, I would say, of the um, of the terms and of the positions. So that's that's good. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. And it's just to say that uh, I, I think I, I'm going to share this with you just now. I, um, we've mentioned already that there will, there's a glossary in the pocket guide. There's always a glossary in your flower guide where you can look up these terms because there are many, many unfamiliar firms, uh, terms. I'm just going to share this with you. I don't know if you can actually see this. Maybe you can actually. Can you see it? But I've... Hold a bit closer to your laptop. Oh, here we are. No, is that better? Yeah, that's good. That's okay, good. so this is the Q plant glossary, and it, it is a, a, an entire slim booklet that um, that describes and illustrates, I would think, all of the botanical terms, the, the plant term terminology for structures, and um, that that you will ever need. And it's brilliant because. Um, they're all clearly explained. There are lots of good illustrations. If you are really going to be uh, needing to, so for example, in your profession, you're going to need to identify 
plant species, then I, I really think it's invaluable um, because you can look that up and know that you're going to find everything you need to know in there. And in, yeah? Uh, yes, yeah, so I've just got a few questions for you. you okay. Um, Anya asks, uh, what is the difference between a stipule and a bract? So I, I don't think that there is much difference in terms of the fact they're both leaf-like structures, just at different places in the plant. The, the stipule is below the, the leaf and the bract is uh, below the flower. But in reality, they tend to be quite different on, on the actual plant. They, they, they usually have a different shape. Sometimes one's toothed uh, or lobed. Uh, so the, they're usually quite distinct, but often they're absent as well. Uh, so not every plant will have stipules, not every plant will have bracts. Um, th does that answer it, uh, Aileen? Well, yes, I think so. And, and just also to, to, to remind you that this is a diagrammatic plant. So, you know, your real plant, uh, all, all of these things may be, may be different. They may look different from, from this diagram here. Now, here's another good question, uh, Aileen. One from four who asks, is there a difference between the, the basal leaf and the first leaves that the dicot seed produce before the true leaves? Oh, that is a good question. Can you answer that, Jim? <laughs> well, the, um, the seed leaves are, are usually quite different from the, the true leaves. Uh, the, they're usually less toothed and, and more simple than the, uh, the, the true leaves. Uh, but they, like the basal leaves, basal true leaves, they do tend to fall off. Uh, so you, you only see them very early on in the season. Um, did, does that answer the... Uh, yeah, and I, yeah. I think um, the... the, the seed leaves are, are pretty similar in, in all species. Is that not the case? Um, whether they're, they're not really representative of what the plant is then going to look like later on? No, very often not, yeah. 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 Uh, now there's a few more questions. Um, Mary said she can only see the quiz. Did, 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 did everyone see the, um, uh, the quiz, quiz results okay? It's, it's, it showed okay on my screen. Did, did you see the quiz results were okay, Aileen? I, I did, and yeah, I did okay. screen, but, in, but not for very long, so perhaps that was the problem. Yeah. Uh, well, well, just in case there's a problem there for some people, um, they, uh, uh, somebody is confirming that the results were, were visible. Ah, that's good. But almost everyone got more than uh, seven. And quite a few people got uh, top marks. Yeah, they did. 14. Yeah, that was well, well done, everyone. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, one, one final question before you get going. Um, have you used both used the pollen and clement vegetative key yet? And if so, how do you find it compared with Francis Rose? <laughs> well, I, I would say that the vegetative key is 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 a very clever book. Uh, which relies wholly on vegetative features, i.e. you don't have to have a plant in flower to be able to identify it. Uh, and there's, there's few other books like that available in the world. It is truly groundbreaking, but it is quite tricky to use. It's much easier to, to learn how to identify plants when they're in flower. So for the meantime, I, I would stick to using uh, Francis Rose or the Wellflower uh, book by Collins. Okay, uh, yeah. right over, over to you, Ailey. I think that's, that's uh, all the questions dealt with at this point. Yeah, we, we had a hand raised there, but I can't see it. I don't know. Are, are you aware of that, Jim? And is there? Oh, uh, I'll have a quick look. Uh, now, quick question for you, Aileen. What was the glossary publication you showed us? Oh, right. Hold up again. It's, it's the Q guide to botanical plant names, yeah, plant yothery, published by Q. And um, 
if you do if you do want to to get more information on that you can always uh, i can always send it to you if you want to email you can we can you know send the complete details of that Brand. okay thanks okay. okay right we'll continue on then from uh, from here and Actually, this is not true. There we are. Sorry. Um, so we've we've looked at the the sort of a diagram of a general plant structure, and we're going to continue now looking in a little more detail at some other of parts, important parts of the plant, starting with the flower. So I'm just going to go through these parts and and with the names. Uh, starting at the top here where we have the petals and the petals collectively are, are termed the corolla. Don't expect us to make anything simple by just calling them um, the straightforward names. So we've got the corolla, always easy to remember in a way by thinking of it as the coloured part of the plant. So a bit of a mix up of the letters and you've got colour, co corolla. So that is the petals collectively. Underneath the green structures underneath are called the sepals. Collectively, they are called the calyx. So down at the bottom here, you'll see that I've, I've said that the, the petals and the sepals together make up the perianth. So this is the perianth, this part here. And um, so we could also say that the corolla and the calyx together make up the perianth. Within the, the, the petals here, then you can see the male parts of the flower, which are the stamens, and they are made up of the stalk or the filament and the anthers. And the anthers, uh, they should be nice and yellow here um, because they carry the pollen. And then the female part of the plant is called the carpal, and this is the ovary or seed container with the stigma at the top, and the stigma is the structure which captures the pollen and, and starts the fertilization, or those two start the fertilization process of the flower. Um, so moving away from the perianth, we've got the flower stalk, which we have met before, termed the pedicel, and on this uh, flower stalk, there is a bract, which you, we've just had a wee bit of conversation about. This may or may not be present. And it is a leaf-like structure. And it may not look like this. So that's the flower. The leaves, again, just a representative of any simple um, diagrams of leaves. There are many many variations of leaf shape and arrangement. And you will, as you start looking at plants, you will come across all, all these different variations and become familiar with them. Um, so on this uh, diagram here, we've got a stem with uh, leaves, which are fairly simple with an entire or smooth leaf margin. They have parallel veins, and these leaves are described as sessile. They have no leaf stalk or no petiole. Petiole is the leaf stalk. Compared, uh, oh, and these leaves are arranged alternately up the stem. So we have one on the right, further up we have one on the left. And if we continued on, th th this would be the pattern, alternate. On the right-hand side, the contrast is that the, these leaves are opposite. Clearly they're arranged in opposite each other on the stem. Also, these leaves, um, this diagram, they have a leaf stalk attaching them to the stem and this is called the petiole. These leaves have branched veins, a toothed leaf margin, and underneath these leaves we have, again, we've spoken about stipules, which may or may not be present and may or may not look like this, but they are small leaf-like structures as well. So very simple diagrams, an introduction to the leaves, and, um, and these are also very important in plant identification. Next, uh, again, we have a, a, a rather special term. The arrangement of flowers is called the inflorescence. 
and this describes how the flowers are arranged on the stem. Again, you'll get to know these um, as you start looking at flowers. It's uh, for me the, the easiest way to remember them is to is to connect an arrangement to a plant, a flower that I know. So, for example, I know that a foxglove, the flowers are arranged in a spike. And once you recognise, you you can you can compare other flowers that you meet and think, oh, what is that like? And uh, therefore, you will be able to 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 name the flower, the arrangement of the flowers on your specimen. Remembering that if you cannot remember, then look up your glossary and check what it tells you, because you know these are not all straightforward when you're starting out. Two more important and helpful concepts before we before we continue is um, the difference between a monocot and a dicot. So here is a, a variety of monocots on this slide. These include um, grasses and sedges and some other plants that you will be familiar with. The um, diagnostic, the uh, feature that, uh, that makes these uh, flowers a monocot is that they have one cotyledon. They are monocotyledons. The cotyledon is the seed leaf that appears on germ germination. So one seed leaf, monocot, uh, monocot is just the shortened form of monocotyledon. And you can recognize these once they are past the germination stage because they have flower parts in multiples of three. So, so this diagrammatic flower has six. Um, they may be similar or dissimilar. So in this um, flag iris here, you will know that the, the petals are dissimilar, but they are in multiples of three. The leaves are simple, not divided into leaflets, and the leaves are always parallel veined. So when we start off looking to identify a new wildflower, the first question we ask is, is it a monocot or is it a dicot? Narrowing down your search. Here are um, examples of dicots or dicotyledons. So you may recognize uh, many of these flowers illustrated here. And the difference uh, arises on germination because dicots or dicotyledons have got two seed leaves on germination that may look like this. So dicotyledons shortened to dicots. The features are five petals is most common. This one has four. Leaves any type simple or compound as illustrated here and the leaves are usually branch veined rather than parallel, and they may have hairy leaves, hairy stem, and so on. But these are the features that you look for. Um, and the next com com uh, concept that will they'll help you when you're starting off uh, to identify your wildflower is that the daisy family composites are different from all the others. So. Uh, some images here. Each individual composite head looks like a single flower, but in fact each is composed of many tiny florets as, in, as illustrated here in this. So each of these individual what look like just petals are actually florets. All the florets in a composite head are directly attached to a saucer-like structure at the head of the stem. Now, here's a great use of your hand lens, and also the dandelions are in, it, it, they're in full flower at the moment, but many of them have already become seed heads. So have a look at them in all their different stages with your hand lens, if you can, and see if you can spot these, um, what, which have now become seeds, uh, developed and ready to, to be 
taken off into the environment. Over here in this clover example, which is not a composite, each floret has a flower stem of its own attached to the stem. So it, this is rather a, um, a not sharp picture, but you can perhaps see that there's a little flower stalk here, which um, is attached to the, uh, to the stem. And whereas these are attached to a, a saucer-like structure. I think you really need to go and have a look at these and uh, see what they really look like on a real flower. In some composites, the florets are all the same. In some composites, the inner and outer florets differ. So in the daisy example, these uh, uh, white outer florets are called um, ray florets. And in the center here, they are called disc florets, but they are all individual little florets cap capable of making, having their own seed. And similarly in the coats, they don't look quite as different, but when you look closely, they, they are different. They're not the same. So you need to know the terms used in the book. This is in your pocket guide, describing plant structure, the flower, the leaves, types of inflorescence, monocots, dicots, composites, but they are all explained in the pocket guide which you will have with you and you can refer to. And remember always, you can look in the glossary of your flower guide and in a sort of pictorial form, here they are as a prompt for these things that you want to be able to remember, to recognize and to study when you're identifying, starting to identify a plant. Right, how to use the pocket guide to wildflowers. Let's try with this example. And we, we know we want to find the family first, uh, but how? Where to start? Well, what do we know? For example, we're going to look at the number, the shape, the color, the position of the petals. And in this example, we have five. Stamens, well, I'm not counting them, but I can see there are many. So you can see them with their anthers and their pollen on the on the top here. The corolla colour, the, the petals are yellow and the shape of this inflorescence, although we're only seeing one small inflorescence here, it would be similar to one of these and it's a panicle, matches up with that structure that we've seen on the, on the page in your guide. The leaf shape, you can see here, it, it's, it, it's just visible is simple, untoothed, unstalked, and the leaf arrangement is opposite. You can also see, looking at this, that the, that the leaves are kind of clasping the, the stem. They certainly don't have a stalk and they're actually sort of wrapped around the stem and almost joining each other. So this is where we go to the pocket guide and page F6, where we're gonna start going through the family's flowchart. So I'm gonna move in so that we can start working our way through. So the first question, is it a monocot? In which case, all of these need to be true. Flower parts in multiples of three, e.g. three petals and three sepals. No, we have five, so we can move on. Is it a composite? Well, we've just looked at a composite flower and this flower does not match that up. So we can say no and move on. Do the flowers form a compound double umbel or a single umbel? Well, checking the diagram here and here and knowing that we've already decided that this is a panicle, the flowers are arranged in a panicle, then the answers here are no, we can move on. Is the flower Four petal, no. When we come to this um, page here, five free petals. Well, we've got five petals. They are not joined or fused, they are free. So we're going, we're going yes. An open radial, well, I'm going to show you that in a moment. And numerous stamens, 
yes, these seem to be matching so far. In that case, we're going to think, is, is this like a, a, a buttercup flower? Yellow or white, no stipules? Doesn't look like a buttercup as we've met them before, perhaps. Uh, leaves alternate. For roses, no, we know our leaves are opposite. Flowers always yellow, opposite unstopped leaves. That's matching. Check St John's works, page three in the book. Sepals three large, two small, no and no. So this is a maybe, but let's carry on on the family's flowchart to see if we just happen to come upon a better fit. So looking at the radial shape that we have uh, in our flower, then here is a, here are two flower um, heads, two, two arrangements that are radially symmetrical. You can, there are lots of axes of symmetry on this flower and the petal arrangement. Compare it with this one over here, which is like a, a violet or a viola, and uh, this is gorse, a pea, a pea flower sort of shape, which you can fold in, in half and has only got that one line of symmetry. This one has got many lines of radial symmetry. So this is what we mean by a radial arrangement. Carrying on, as above but 10 stamens, no, as above but five stamens, no, we have more than that. Continuing, five petal radial fused only at the base. No, we don't have that arrangement. A five petal radial in a bell or a tube, no, because we've already, we've already established that this is a free, um, petals are, are free and not fused or joined. A flower with mirror symmetry, well, that was the other symmetrical um, shape we saw on the slide a few moments ago. So where you would fold it in, in half and one side mirrors the other. We don't have that. So we've come to, uh, to no. Flowers green and or insignificant, no. We're now at the end of the family's flow chart. And so we're going to go back to our page which which um which we decided it might it, it might be it may be so our best match so far is St John's Wort and that's on page three of the pocket guide so let's go there and the pictures certainly look similar to our flower so a little bit of snap there a little bit of matching but let's actually go through the description and check that the description of a St. John's wort is what our plant fits into. Five petals, an open radial yellow, a panicle, the leaves, these are bracts here actually, but we've already seen the leaves earlier and they're very similar to these. Simple, untoothed, unstocked, opposite, other points, numerous stamens and bundles, leaves with translucent veins, and you can't see that here, but again, your hand lens, looking carefully at the features, you would be able to um, distinguish these and decide whether that was the case or not. So it looks like the slipper fits, and we can then go, we're being pointed in the direction of where we would look up our uh, flower guide. But I just want to point out here that if you don't have, and we have had someone already ask, if you don't have either of these two, you don't need to worry. You simply look up the um, the, the name of, of the family in English or in Latin and in your index, and then go to that page to look up either the key or the start of this family of flowers so that you can start to look through them and see if you can find um, the species. But we'll come back to that later. 
Okay, so um, we're going to have another break now. And uh, I've left you another little task to do here. This is your Coffee Break Challenge 2. And I'm wondering if you could go to the pocket guide and try to find the family for this plant illustrated here. So just a close up of the flowers and um, quite a portion of the plant here. Uh, I'm going to leave it on this page so you can see the photographs and you're going to go back to the uh, family flow chart starting at is it a monocot and 10 minute break see if you can find the family for this plant. Okay. Hello everyone. Um, okay uh, just before Aileen's restarts uh, I see there's been a few interesting questions. Uh, during the break. Um, Helen George has asked, uh, why do all families end up with the uh, suffix ACA? Now, I didn't know the answer to this. I mean, I, I did realise that they, they all ended up with that uh, suffix. Uh, so, so I did a, a quick bit of uh, research and the answer is this. Uh, according to agreement reached in the mid 1900s by members of the International Code of Botanical Nomenclature, all scientific names uh, end in A-C-E-A-E. -E. Um, and A-C-E is the Latin for a family. So I, I never knew that before. So, so thank you for asking that question, that's brilliant. Um, so A-C -E is, is the Latin for family or, or a group. So Rose A-C-E, for example, just means the Rose family. So it just, just goes to show everybody's on a learning curve. <laughs> and, and actually, that's a really important thing uh, to, to bear in mind. Whenever you're out with, with botanists, uh, everybody's on a learning curve. Don't worry about feeling like you're a beginner. So, so do come along on field meetings. And, you know, sign up for BSBI field meetings or local field meetings in your area and get out, get out with other botanists. They're, they're usually really friendly people very keen to, to teach and um, uh, a great source of information for you. Now, uh, another question uh, from Aaron, he asked, do you, do you have any tips or resources for lear learning botanical Latin? Well, as a beginner, I might not suggest that you start learning uh, the scientific names. Um, you know, whenever I come, Whenever I come across a new species, I try. I do try and learn both the common name in English and the scientific. But I realise that is quite hard for for complete beginners. Um, but if you can, it's a, it's certainly a good thing to try to do. Um, but it, it definitely helps if you can, if if you are trying to uh, learn botanical Latin. Uh, there's quite a few books actually out there. Uh, which um, explains what those Latin uh, names mean. Uh, and, but the, the, there's a short list of names which pop up regularly in lots of plant species. Things like um, Arvensis, which means field, Muralis, which means water, Aquatilis, uh, sorry, Muralis, which means wall, Aquatilis, which means water. So it's really useful to, to understand what, what those terms mean uh, and makes it easier to remember the, the botanical Latin. Uh, now, Aileen, uh, this could be a question for you. Um, can you explain again um, compound umbels? It's from Tanya. Oh, right, okay. Um, in that case, we might just um, use this example. Um, which was the coffee break challenge. Uh, so um, I hope you all had a go at this and we'll, um, and, I'm, and I'm pretty sure you will have been successful. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. Uh, you would have started here. Uh, is it a monocot? Oh, and just to say, I do realise that we are running a little bit behind time or perhaps a lot behind time. So we'll try to be um, smart. Uh, in getting through the next uh, the next set the next section, um, so um, this is the page that, that I got to with these pictures, 
and um, dew flowers form a compound or double umbel. And if you look at this diagram here, just um, because I, I think it does, I think the plant does, the flowers do form a compound umbel. So if you look at these little, um, these little groups of flowers up here, they form an umbel. So you can see the shape of them. I always think of an umbrella fir as an umbrella fir, so it's like an umbrella. And um, so you've got a little umbrella up here. And then if you take all of the, these little flower heads, these little umbels together, they form, form a second um, bigger umbrella, um, um, umbrella fir. So you, you've got one little umbel here, and then you've got a bigger overarching umbel here. And so that's what's described as a cot. You can see it perhaps better here as well. You, you, the overall shape is an umbel as well as this little one. I hope that explains it. Jim, do you think that explains it? Yeah, that, that's uh, a great answer. Okay. Yep. So uh, how did we get here? I, I'm not going to go through the whole process because I'm, I'm pretty sure that even if you were playing snap, this time you would have got to the umbellifers or the carrot family, which are called the APSI, APSI, um, the carrot family. So um, let's just go through what you would hopefully have found when you looked at these pictures. So five tiny petals on each of these little um, flower heads. The corolla shape is radial. So that's each of these is a radial shape as we've seen previously. The corolla color as white or yellow or can be pink. That's a yellow one. The inflorescence is typically a compound or double umbel as described. Small umbel making a, altogether a bigger umbel. The leaf shape, simple or co compound, often fern-like. Fern -like. You'd need to zoom in to see this um, is a a compound. There are there are pairs of leaflets on the on the st leaf stem, so it, it's not a simple leaf. The leaf arrangement alternate, often sheathing bases, and you can see um, certainly here you can see that the the sheath where the leaf um, joins the main stem. Uh, Fruits are often essential for precise identification. So if we were going to identify this as a species, we would probably manage with this one, but um, you might need the, the seeds um, when they are formed to actually distinguish between species. Um, so I, I hope you got here to umbellifers. And you know, once, once you've become a little bit familiar, you'll be able to spot umbellifers fairly easily and quickly as a family and then you'll be able to then go on to identify them at to species level I hope. Okay so we're going to move on to an introduction to identification keys and using a field guide and we're going to um, try to identify these six poppies and here is the key we're going to use. I'm not going to go through this uh, in great detail after we've done perhaps one or two of these. But the key, as you can see, there are six questions. Each question has an A and a B. And when you've answered the question, yes or no, it, it will tell you, will instruct you what to do next. So petals red, go to five. Petals not red, go to two. So let's start with poppy number one, petals red, Yes, go to five. We can ignore all of these and then go to 5A. Smaller crimson flowers, bristly seed pods, south and midlands only, or larger sc scarlet flowers, smooth seed pods. And we have a, a yes there because we don't have bristly seed pods. Go to six. Um, I'm going to have to move this out of my way. Um, flowers, so 6A flowers slightly pinkish, seed pods long and thin. Yes. Um, if we go down to the, the next one, flowers true scarlet, often black centered seed pods round, we can see that the seed pod is long and thin rather than round. So 
Our answer here is long-headed puppy. Um, try then puppy number two. Again, petals red, yes, go to five. Five A, um, we're really looking to see bristly seed pods. We can't really see this terribly clearly, but let's carry on. Um, larger scarlet flowers, smooth seed pods, go to six. Flowers slightly pinkish, seed pods long and thin, no. Flowers true scarlet, often black centered, seed pods round. Then out of all these choices, we're going to arrive at common puppy. So it's just a case of answering the questions in each couplet and choosing the best fit. Again, petals red here. So I'm going to skip this one because we've done red petals. Okay, this one, this time we've got answer to the first question, petals red is no. So B is petals not red, go to two. Two A, petals yellow or orange, no. B, petals not yellow or orange, go to three. Three A, petals lilac, we've come to our answer. It is the only poppy in the six that has lilac petals. Therefore, this is opium poppy. Poppy number five. Again, we've got a no to start with, go to two. This time petals yellow or orange, yes, go to four. And this one, sprawling on coastal shingle, seed pods long and curved. So this gives us a habitat clue. This is where we should be finding it. And the seed pods are, in this case, long and curved. They're not very distinct here, but they are very long and curved. And if you look at the other poppy pictures, there isn't another um, seed pod that is this long and curved. So that description brings us to yellow horned poppy for number five. And for number six, we've got um, another not red poppy. So we can go down these couplets and go to four. Stony places or near gardens, seed pods egg shaped. So again, we're looking at this, the color and the seed pod um, to give us our answer this time of Welsh poppy. So I hope that shows that this is relatively simple. You are doing comparisons and finding the best fit at each question. And you may sometimes have to go down all of the questions before you can come back and say, well, this is the, this is the right answer for this um, specimen that I'm looking at. So we're now going to look at using a field guide, using the same principle of, of, the, um, of the key. And we're gonna go back to this example where we found the family, which we decided was a St. John's wort, but which species is it? So here is the page three um, in the pocket guide where we made the choice of our family. And now to find the species, we're being guided to the Wildflower Key or Collins guide. And I did mention before that if you don't have these guides, then just look it up in the index, find where your key or your that family starts and then go through, work your way through them. Um, for me, when I looked up the index here, I came to page 156 in the Collins Guide. And then down here, it tells me C key to Hypericum on page 160. And that's what I've done. So here I'm at page 160. And this is the beginning of the key for the um, St. John's Work family. So we're going to look at the features that we've, we've looked at on our diagrammatic plant. And we're going to answer these questions. And of course, we don't have a whole plant here, so you're going to have to trust me with some of these answers <clears throat> um, that, I, that I've seen the whole plant and um, that, that we can answer these correctly. So number one says, if the plant is more or less shrubby with the stems woody, then go to 10. But 
you can't see fully, but our, our plant actually is not shrubby and the stems are not woody or only at the base. The ours is not a woody shrubby plant, so go to two. At number two stems glabrous, leaves glabrous or sparingly hairy beneath. Glabrous means hairless. So I'm pointing at the underside of the leaf here and the stem. Stem looks perhaps sparingly hairy, but the um, the leaves are, are certainly glabrous. You would need your hand lens to check carefully because they're not always easy to see by eye. Uh, or the alternative is stems and leaves conspicuously hairy, which they are not. So we are going to go to three. Number three stems with two ridges or stems with four ridges, square in section, and I've shown a, a, an image of that down here, which we, we clearly don't have. Stems smooth with no ridges. So looking at our stem, we go to eight. Smooth stems, no ridges. So we're gonna skip to eight. So here, is where you might need a, a small ruler. There's usually one on your um, flower guide, but it's quite handy to have a small plastic ruler that you can just put right up uh, against the plant. Leaves 0.5 to one centimeter and glabrous hairless beneath. That takes us to hi um, Hypericum pulchrum. Leaves three to five centimeters, sparsely hairy and with marginal row of black glands beneath. Again, using your hand lens, you would be able to see that that was not the case. These leaves are hairless, and therefore we can stop here at Hypericum pulchrum, which is slender St. John's wort. So where to conclude? I've found the family. I've worked through the key in my field guide. I've arrived at my species. Uh, but wait, we need to read the description um, in the flower guide to make sure that each of these criteria match our plant and our, ma our plant matches these criteria. So this is what the description will look like. And this is the description for Slender St. John's Wort um, in the Collins Guide, page 158 described as an erect glabrous perennial to 60 centimeters. Stems without raised lines, leaves to one centimeter with transparent glands, broadly chordate, that's heart-shaped, their bases clasping and meeting across the stem. Flowers 1.5 centimeters across, the petals red tinged, the sepals fringed with black stalked black glands. Remember the sepals are the green parts under the petals. The habitat, grassy heaths, commons, woodland clearings, rides on well-drained acid soils to 820 metres above sea level. The distribution, native throughout the British Isles, and I think here it says uh, West and Central Europe. And the flowering season is June to August. So just to summarise those features that come up in the description, you're going to look at and check the stems, the leaves, the flowers, that is the, the flowering, the, the arrangement, the inflorescence, the habitat, the distribution, have you found it where it actually occurs? Where does it tell you in the book? If you found it in the north of Scotland, and actually its distribution is in the very south of England, then you should be starting to frown and wonder, mm, is there a problem here? Uh, the flowering season as well, um, is it, is it, does it match? Have you found a, a, a plant in flower that matches the flowering season for that plant? So now I've found the family, I've worked through the key in my field guide, I've arrived at my species and my specimen matches all of the description. So that's really important uh, to do that very, that very last check. 
that helps you to find to, to be sure that you've found the correct species or do you need to go back and look more closely? Um, okay, um, so we're just going to, uh, having gone through the, the key, what you need to what you need to do and what we would normally do, as Jim said earlier, is to go out into the field and start practicing these uh, skills and using the, the knowledge and, and sharing, um, asking these questions with others. And we can't do that in this setup. But um, in order to develop your interest, I'm, I'm going to suggest that you love your wildflowers, go out and enjoy them, make the most of the changes in what's flowering through the seasons, enjoy different habitats. Take your ID book and, hen and hand lens with you whenever you're out and about. Use them whenever you see a flowering plant that you can't identify or to remind yourself of the names of species you don't recognize. Carefully check the likelihood of the species being found there and then. Read the information on where it occurs and when it flowers. If necessary, refer to more local information in floras, uh, on checklists, and on the BSBI maps webpage. Um, checking that, that this flower you found is likely to, to be the one you found in that location. Um, we've actually included a, a sheet on um, um, furthering your interest and developing your, your knowledge um, sent out with the flower diagram and uh, that will be hopefully really helpful for you to find out um, to find out ways of, of gaining experience. Um, go on wildflower identification courses, another great way to learn and lots of fun. The Field Studies Council runs a variety of courses. Go on BSBI field meetings and training events to meet other botanists. Check your understanding is correct. Ask questions. Several are organized especially for beginners and improvers every year. Check out the BSBI field meeting program and BSBI local groups uh, programs. Just basically do as much as you can and the more time you spend on it then you will progress more quickly if you're really keen or you need to know, especially if you're going to be doing survey work and uh, using your skills professionally. So we've also um, included, uh, sent to you by email, this wee uh, homework uh, task or challenge. Um, I'm not going to go through it carefully at the moment because it's all on the sheet, but it is an opportunity for you to um, let us help you to um, go out and try your skills with flowers in the field um, using the pocket guide and your wildflower book um, and, uh, and letting us check up as, as if we would as if we would have been there with you <laughs> to, to see whether you're on the right lines. But it's, it'd be good practice for you. So I really highly recommend that you that you take that opportunity and use us to, to help you. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much for joining the workshop and uh, how much appreci it's appreciated for you to, to come and do this uh, webinar uh, rather than being actually with us in the room. And I'd like to say a huge thanks to Faith and to Jim for all the help they've given me in uh, preparing this uh, presentation and to all of those who uh, gave us the use of their photographs in the presentation. Um, we'd like to acknowledge Nature Scots funding, which supports the work of Jim as the Scottish officer and the BSBI in Scotland. Um, I had some lovely photographs from Alan Walker. You can look up his Identify Mountain Flowers of Britain and Ireland online, and it's a really super publication. Um, photographs and uh, diagrams to help you to um, understand some of these lovely plants. Um, and I'd like to wish you happy wildfire hunting and also to ask any further questions um, and do take part in the um, 
uh, photographic uh, identification that, that we're offering for you to, to send photographs into us. Aileen, thank yeah. you very much for presenting that so beautifully. Um, now, we've got a few questions here. Um, Bell is asking, what was the plant species at the second break? Okay, um, shall I go back to that? Yeah, I slide. Do. Okay, let's go slip, uh, skip back. Oh, here we are, here we are. Okay, so um, this is a wild angelica. Um, Latin name, I Jim will know. I don't uh, know. Angelica sylvestris. So it's, it's not one of those. Or sylvatica, uh, sylvatica, sorry. <laughs> so it's not uh, one of these on the page here, but it is down here as other examples um, on page 17 of the guide, wild angelica. So you, if you look that up in your field guide, you should be able to match up the features that you can see here, particularly if you can um, home in on the leaf shape and uh, um, an arrangement. And uh, these sheaths, I think, would be quite diagnostic. Is that right, Jim? Yes. Yeah, so the, the, yeah, the species has massive uh, sheaths. Uh, and of course, it is a close relative of garden angelica, which is used for um, uh, food. Um, yeah, a, a, love, a lovely plant species of uh, uh, very wet grasslands and uh, water edge habitats. Yeah, often along ditches or, yeah, nice damp places. Yeah. Now, uh, another question. Um, where have we gone? I guess here they are. Is climate change having a significant impact on the published flowering periods? Well, it's a bit hard to tell, to be honest. Um, I think what has more of a, an impact is the actual weather in a, any particular season. But we, we've just had a very cold spring, uh, as, uh, as you all know, and that has delayed things. So it's, some things come into flower um, a bit later than normal. Um, but we are looking into this question, actually. We have a little project which you run every year, and I, I recommend uh, you participate in, called the New Year Plant Hunt. And the idea of that is to uh, record all plants that are actually in flower in the first four days of the new year while you're on holiday uh, and submit them to the uh, new, uh, new Year Plant Hunt webpage. Uh, there's an app as well and, and, and we analyze uh, those results and, and what we can say from that is uh, about a third of species are things that flower late in the season and are uh, carrying on over Christmas and New Year but a third are early flowering species that are just flowering a bit earlier and a third are species that flower throughout the year. <laughs> So things like um, annual meadow grass and um, uh, gorse, for example, they, they flower at almost any time of the year. So, so our looking into that question, it is hard to answer it, but it's a really good question. Um, now, let me see, are there any other questions? Oh, yes, quite a lot of questions. Can you recommend a suitable camera, compact camera? Um, can anyone help with that, please? Um, I, I'm afraid I, I tend to use my, my smartphone, but smartphones are not great at focusing on the very tiny parts of flowers. It, um, and, and it's but it's hard enough with compact cameras, to be honest. Uh, but I think with a, uh, a compact camera, you probably more chance of getting a sharp image of very small flowers than with a smartphone. Um, thank you for that one. Now, uh, Neil Barker asks, um, I've had a go at this uh, the last few weeks, trying to distinguish raceme and acime in the field, and have found it difficult. Uh, any tips? Um, okay, Aileen. Uh -huh. <laughs> can, 
this might mean going back quite a long way in the presentation. <laughs> but I think I think it was, it was a pretty good diagram at one point. Right, I need to. So, uh, Arasim, um, um, and uh, Jim can help me here if I'm going to get this wrong. But Arasim has um, one flower on a on a stalk coming from the main stem or, or the branch. Is that right? Yeah, I, th I think all the, uh, the flowers uh, uh, come off the main central stem so, in, in, the, in the inflorescence in a raceme. Whereas so, in a... Sorry. sorry, go on. No, uh, I was just your... so looking at the Rosebay willow herb here, you can see that the flowers are arranged going up, coming from the main stem on a... Yeah, on a yeah. In a sign, they've we've got forget me not, and Jim, you maybe want to describe this. Well, th this is a typical forget me not type arrangement, um, with a, a main uh, the main stem terminates in the flower. There's a branch, it's another flower, a branch off the branch, and so on, uh, and, and so the whole flower sort of curves, uh, the whole inflorescence curves round, um, in a little circle with, with it. The youngest flowers at the very, they're still closed uh, at the very um, um, uh, end, and uh, flower the, the oldest flowers probably starting to develop into fruits, uh, and appearing lower down the, the, the stem. Yeah, and maybe just to say uh, as well that, you know, a, a racine and a spike are very similar, except that the uh, flowers on the racine are the same sort of arrangement, except they've got a stalk attaching them to the stem, a flower stalk. Um, whereas the spike, it doesn't have a stalk. The flowers are on the stem yeah. without, a, without a flower stalk. So if you perhaps look for a similar um, structure to a spike, but then has if it's got a if the flower has got a little stem, a little stalk on it, then it's a racine. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's just experience in in looking at different flowers and looking at the description of them once you know what they are, and and then trying to become familiar with what that looks like. Maybe comparing it to a forget me not and having that image in your head. Yeah, uh, Sean has come back to me about cameras. Thank you, Sean. He says uh, he's used the Sony RX 100's compact camera for several years, uh, and uh, he highly recommends it and has it has decent close focusing uh, capabilities. And older models can be picked up secondhand uh, at reasonable prices. Um, any other questions? Oh yes, Helen's asked. Uh, it says she didn't get the homework email, so I, I sent the homework email along with the um, diagram of the plant uh, last night about six o'clock I think so anyway I'm planning to send another email out to all participants uh, very shortly after um, the workshop along with a feedback form it'd be great if um, uh, you would complete the feedback form um, I, I'm, I'm sorry we can't get into the field because ideally what we want to do right now is all go out in the field together uh, and uh, have a bit of fun looking at plants. But, but it's up to you uh, to, to do that suggested homework. Um, so, so get out, look for five flowers you don't recognise, take photographs, uh, try and figure out what they are using the pocket guide and your flower book and hand lens and uh, email Aileen uh, with the pictures and your plant families and species all clearly marked up um, and we'll get back to you. Um, I ho hope that doesn't mean you're going to be inundated uh, <laughs> <laughs> Aileen but no but no, we, we'd love to, 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 to see how you get on with that. Uh, do you have a deadline for homework? Um, well, I think it's I think it's pretty important you do it soon while all, all the stuff is is fresh in your mind. But bearing in mind the weather is pretty nasty in some parts of Britain, just uh, Britain and Ireland just now. Um, can we say a week? 
yeah, okay. A week. It, 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 or a fortnight, do you think? Is a fortnight too long? Maybe, yeah. maybe it is. Up to you, Aileen. Yeah. You say. A, a, a fortnight is, I think a fortnight is ideal. A fortnight, okay. Fortnight. Yeah. Brilliant. Now, okay. any more questions? That is the question. That is the question. Um, no, I think, I think that's it. Okay, Aileen. That's brilliant. Thank you very much for preparing that lovely presentation. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed that and found it useful. Um, I, so I, I, as I said, I'll email the feedback form uh, along with the handout that I sent last night. I'll resend that. Um, and I'll, I'll record, uh, I'm gonna record the um, presentation and hopefully we'll make that available uh, to view again on the BSBI YouTube channel. Now, I should actually mention there are loads of training videos on the YouTube, uh, the BSBI YouTube channel, and it's worth having a look. They're not, I mean, there's very few aimed at complete beginners, but th there may be one or two which uh, would interest you. Take, take a look. Um, so there's also some excellent talks on. on botany and botanical topics. Um, so uh, get out there, get out with your pocket guide, field guide and hand lens and camera and uh, have fun. Thank you very much everyone. Okay yes thank you from me as well, thanks very much. Okay thank you, bye for now. Bye.